Uh, because as we struggled for what does social justice mean in our work at this moment, we really, um, you know, we're, you know, we all care about the environment. We all care about, you know, da 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 da. But what does it what does it really mean, and how do we do it on a day to day basis and keep ourselves going? So today for our plenary, um, we, we've asked three incredible people to come kind of share some of those perspectives with us. And um, I have to say my new best friend is on the panel now, um, Doug Amar. Um, and um, Lori and I are like, we are going to be in with Doug and his family. Watch out. So the, 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 the real frame is to go one level further, um, you know, all of us who follow Lexi around the world, um, you know, she kept, like, we would think, talk, whatever, and then Lexi would drill us deeper, and she'd say, what about this? Have you seen this? Have you thought about that? And, and then a few days, a week or so ago before the conference, she sent us this um, link to this guy. His name is Marshall Gans, G-A-N-Z. Marshall Gans. Have people heard of him? Raise your hand if you've heard of him. Like three of us, right? I had not. So he is a lecturer at the Public Policy School at Harvard. Um, he spent much time in the civil rights movement in the South. He was an organizer for the United States Farm Workers. He is credited with devising the reason that Obama is president, with organizing the grassroots campaign. And he has this framing that um, some of us have probably heard of um, this guy way back when from history called Hillel. Um, but he uh, kind of thought a lot about um, kind of this thing phrase that some of us are probably living with on a daily basis right now. But um, if I am not for myself, who will be? If I am for myself alone, what am I? And if not now, when? Right? And Marshall Gantz took that and he said, how do, how do we make that real? How do we make that today? And um, so he um, has this framing that's um, the story of self, the story of us, and the story of now. And um, we decided that that would be a way. Oh, I have to explain to you. Um, that, that that's like a way. Turn the temperature up. That that's kind of a framing that we're going to use today for this conversation. So with that, I am going to turn it over to my dear friend Tim Floyd to um, kick us off. Our plan is to have a conversation among our three panelists, and rather than one of us introduce them, we're going to start our segment with the story of self, and I'm going to ask each of our three panelists to introduce themselves. So briefly, if you could each tell us your professional journey, uh, how you came to be where you are now. Doug. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Doug Amar. I'm the only, I guess, non-academic here, so thanks for letting me be here. You can take me on later. Uh, I'm a lawyer, and I'm the director of the Georgia Justice Project in Atlanta, and I've been there full-time for 28 years. Uh, the organization is a nonprofit legal organization. Uh, we take no government funds, even though we represent our name. Uh, we do really three things. We do a holistic criminal defense following our folks. We do criminal defense to follow our folks in the prison and afterwards, and help our clients' families as well. Uh, and then uh, I was just telling Alex about the, our criminal records work, which is growing quite significant. We represent people all around the state on criminal records issues, something with expungements and with jobs and housing and spite of having been arrested or convicted. And lastly, we do policy work that relates uh, to really the entry for folks coming out of the criminal justice system. Uh, let me stop there. Is that we'll follow okay, up. We'll Thanks, follow up. All right. Lexi. Uh, I'm Lexi. I'm really sort of privileged to be in this space because there are many other people in the audience who could sit in this chair um, far more qualified than me, so I just want to throw that out there. Um, but uh, I think it's important. Um, so, but um, I'm at Denver Law. I wear a few different hats um, related to externships and public interest initiatives there. Um, I have the a real luck of being a faculty member. I recognize that brings some privilege and some ability for me to be um, even more creative um, and, and have some support for that. So I'm um, thankful for that. Um, but I joined the um, academy sort of randomly, but um, in the sense that I was working um, as what I would call racial justice movement lawyers, so supporting low-income communities of color um, in their organized efforts. Um, so a range of issues, education, voting rights, closer training, New Orleans, housing, et cetera. Um, but really see the sort of lawyer as partner, um, rather as lawyer as parachuter in, or lawyer as um, the expert. So um, I, and I came to see that a lot of students who work with us fellows, as interns, et cetera, didn't really know what that meant, but not really getting any training on that in law school, so that kind of, um, made me think I could have more of a difference if I could actually really train, train the next generation of folks so with that philosophy and supporting others. Daisy. Well, hi, everyone. I'm Daisy Floyd. And um, it's, an, <coughs> excuse me, it's an interesting question for me to answer sitting in this room, because in the fall of 1977, um, 
my first day of law school orientation was in this room. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, a long time ago, uh, I was one of about maybe 25 to 30 percent of the law school class who were women. We were new then um, to legal education. In fact, the, the restroom upstairs that is now again a men's room had urinals in it. They had converted it to women's room. Anyway, I'm digressing. <laughs> on my journey since then that did start here at UGA. Um, and I will say that I was sitting next to Tim. We were newlyweds at the time, uh, starting law school. And the other outstanding memory this morning is that we did not know before orientation to check the bulletin board for an assignment. So it was in this room where we got our first lesson in being a law student. People started getting called on and they had the assignments. We didn't. But we survived and we're still here to talk about it. So anyway, um, graduated from did a short stint in a big firm in Atlanta. Uh, that ended shortly after um, our first child was born. He was a law firm then, nor I knew how to incorporate being a mother into that kind of practice. Um, and fortunately, um, we ended up back here at UGA, um, which gave both of us our introduction into being legal educators. So since that time, I've taught in law school for 34 years. Um, seven of that was here at UGA in a non-tenured track legal research and writing position, so that's how I got started. Um, out of the remaining years, uh, I spent about 17 in administrative positions. Um, I went to Texas Tech, um, got on the tenure track there, became tenured, and had an opportunity to become associate dean for academic affairs there. And then came to Mercer University, where I am now in 2004, and in my time here, 10 of those years was as dean. Um, two stints interrupted by a little hiatus in the middle, and um, as of July 1st of this past year, I'm no longer dean, and I get to enjoy being a <laughs> During that time, I've taught a variety of courses, including externships, so I'm delighted to be this Let's dig a little deeper into your personal stories, um, and I'd like to ask you about any particular moments of significance in your career or people of influence. Um, and let me start with you, Lexi, for this one. Um, yeah, you know, for me, it actually begins um, not with the law at all. Um, when I was in the first grade, I had Mrs. McGran. Um, we were doing this sort of cultural class, and you were to identify how you identify, essentially. So if you're Jewish, raise your hand. I raise my hand. If you're Christian, raise your hand. I raise my hand. If you're black, raise your hand. Uh, if you're white, you know, and they, that kind of got divided. Italian, Russian, yes, I kept raising my hand. If you're um, Native American, I raised my hand. And then, um, much of sort of when I think about this now in the role as a teacher, um, uh, I sort of got chastised and said, Lexi, um, you're not following the instructions. You're just your hand, um, and you're not listening. The instructions are only raise your hand when you um, identify with the group. And I was like, I do identify with these groups. And fast forward the story, it was um, there were many meetings with um, Mrs. Moran and my parents who, in fact, identified with both of those groups. Um, and it was, um, you know, it's sort of, it's kind of a funny story, but it was also an incredibly traumatic experience yeah, um, as a seven-year-old who grew up in a household where um, my identity was kind of taught to me very early, and um, but also for the privilege I had because of um, the various identities and because of my appearance, um, and um, it really challenged who I was at the core. Um, and I think from then on, um, I sort of said, well, two things. One, I'm going to continue to be as firm as I ever was in my identity because it matters, um, but also, um, Clearly, there's a lot to be sort of um, learned and discussed, and I thought that maybe I would have a way um, to have, see if I could get a pulpit, because I knew I had a lot of privilege, despite all of those identities, um, to sort of um, <coughs> uh, make sure that that doesn't happen to someone else, um, and whether it be Mrs. McGran or whoever else. Um, so that was kind of the first time, I think, that um, uh, it was my first key memory of feeling very different, um, and certainly not my last, and anyone who identifies with any sort of um, uh, way of marginalization knows that these sort of things happen in, in different ways. Um, but I think I then began to realize also over time um, that it wasn't just individual, right? It was structural and it was really embedded in every institution that I, um, that I joined. Um, so I never really thought the law, but I thought sort of racial justice, right? And, um, and I figured out that the law was a tool, right? Um, to open the doors to racial justice. But when I think about the keenest memory, um, that is um, probably the keenest memory I have of what I said, sort of social justice is going to be me. Daisy, people of significance? 
Well, there have been a lot. I think I'm the oldest one on the panel, so uh, I'll have to abbreviate my, my answers a little bit. Um, one moment of influence for me was that I did start my college education at a women's college, and that um, opened up a lot of opportunities for me and made me think differently about what I wanted to do um, after college and beyond, and that's what opened up the idea of law school to me. Uh, and I'm grateful for that experience and the professors there who helped me uh, to achieve that. But I will say that I was one of the unhappy law students that I know some of these panels have talked about. I did not enjoy law school and I did not understand why I was not enjoying it. And I think that experience led to really a very significant moment in my career and that is after I moved into administration and became associate dean out of Texas, I was seeing our students and their experiences from a different perspective than I had been seeing it in the classroom. And, and you do see in that role more difficulty, more distress, more dysfunction perhaps. Um, and, and more and more about the burdens that students are carrying. And that coincided with my involvement in the wellness movement that was going on in the profession. And I began to ask questions about what we were doing in law school that might be seeding um, some of that distress that we were seeing in the profession. And um, those questions for me coincided with an opportunity to begin working with the Carnegie Foundation around those issues. And I didn't know how to address them, but I seized upon this phrase, professional identity. So in the mid-90s, I started to work on these topics of how does law school affect our students and the professional identity that they are acquiring. Um, and that's led me in a lot of different directions, um, continuing to lead me in a lot of different directions. But the bottom line is, and I don't think this group will be surprised, that I learned that law school, for all of its positive effects, can also have the negative effects of separating students from self, of uh, causing them to lose the purpose that brought them to law school. And what I've been trying to explore ever since is how we can remediate that. Um, and of course there's a lot out there, but uh, for me one way is to help them with their identities and to help them to be authentic as lawyers and as human beings. And that means trying to help them find a way that their work and their lives can reflect their most deeply held beliefs and values. Um, I think we do that through skills of reflection, through skills of connection, through a lot of other work with our students. Um, but that was the, the coming together of a number of different pieces for me with some generous support um, from many other people in the mid-90s that's a huge influence on So tell us about the moments and people of significance to you. So I, uh, in the summer of 1986, I think on a couple of years off from college uh, and decided to sell toothpaste for uh, two years for Procter & Gamble. <laughs> um, so uh, on the way to law school, I came to Atlanta to do some urban work in this urban ministry, and I was there for the summer. I was on the way to law school, and somebody directed me, said, you should meet that guy over there. And the guy that people kept directing me to in my, this church and this community, Grant Park area of Atlanta, uh, was the, the founder of our organization, a guy named John Pickens, who had been a corporate litigator, we had King's Ball Bank. So I convinced him, it took him a while to let me volunteer. He was, had his office out of his house, it was a one-person shop, and, Done some internships at public defender offices, and so I, you know, I thought I could help. But it uh, took me a while to convince me. Without getting all the stories, which Tim and Daisy heard a few over the years. <laughs> at, the end of, uh, at the end of the summer, I sat down with him, and uh, I'm you know, getting ready to go to law school, and, and I had volunteered on some cases, and did some investigation by the court and the jail. And I sat with him, and my friend, friend is John, is, uh, he's still alive, he, uh, he's in Alabama, he's from Alabama originally. And he uh, was, a, uh, was a Davis Cup tennis player, played at Wimbledon twice, was a Mr. Basketball in the 60s before integration uh, in Alabama. I mean, he was an athlete. He was just amazing. He's written about 250 songs. Some of his art is hanging in, San, uh, in uh, Santa Fe as well as places in New York. The guy's the crazy renaissance. I mean, he's just amazing. Most humble, low-key guy you meet. But he's a guy that comes from positions of power and wealth. And I sat with him, and being the young, you know, impetuous, soon to be law student, I said, uh, John, this is great work. I said, but tell me, uh, you know, what are you doing to change the system? He looked at me, didn't skip a beat, said nothing. I remember just like, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Sitting in his office in his house, and I'm like, what, what, what do you mean? I mean, John, the, the system, I mean, the criminal justice system, it, it's, it's broken, right? This is the 80s. It only was going to get a lot worse. And he's like, yeah, it's really bad. 
I'm like, well, and I'm thinking, and, what, and I said, well, why aren't you trying to change that? I, mean, well, I don't understand. And he said, he said, he just looked at me very calmly. He says, I'm going to work one person at a time, going to make a difference for them, and to help them and to change their lives if we can, and then give it to somebody else. Now, I'll tell you that story because I, for the next like, three years of law school, John and I stayed in touch. I could not go to church with him. And it was so deflating. I remember it was so deflating. I remember because what he had done, and I think there's a lot of race and gender and all this, too, that I was not even aware of. I think the sense of being, you know, what most people perceive as a white guy that's a whole other story. They, you know, you're going to law school, you're going to change the system. I mean, you know, this is, you know, if you have positions of power, you're trying to help. Well, why not try to change the system? And I remember thinking, that was just so humbling. And I, now let me fast forward, you know, four years later, I came back, as was volunteering again, and worked, and I got a job, John, I was the second full-time employee of the office. And I remember sitting on our office on Edgewood Avenue, uh, and some of you know it, and been down, uh, this was one of the very rough, very poor uh, addiction and stuff, and I remember thinking, myself, like, is this what I worked so hard for? Is this why I struggled to make the grades and, and uh, to get myself out of poverty and all that? And, and I, I think the thing here is that with, with John, the, 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 what John was telling me from the very beginning is that, um, is, this, is first of all just to show up, mm -hmm. right? Show up and be present, and be present to the person in front of you. And I got to tell you, as, as an idealistic 22 or 24 year old, and a, and a 27 or 28 year old lawyer, that was incredibly humble. And for the next hour, we, and I've talked about the sum, for the next six months, I think, in the, in the work, when I was a full time employee, I really, uh, I really felt like I could smell decaying flesh around. I mean, it was that, it was that point to me. It was like part of me was dying. It had to die. And it was that seed that John had planted four years ago. That the sense of which you know, maybe we're not here to change the system. Maybe we're here just to make a difference with one person. And that, to me, was incredibly humbling. And what it told me, and was the basis for my next, you know, I've been doing this for quite a while, is that um, it's not something a lot of young people want to hear. Is that maybe you show up, maybe make a difference with one person. Uh, so that was that really framed the many next 15 or so years of my professional life that let me go and find the humility because I, I didn't enter that space too humble. <laughs> But I, I had to find the humility to be present and try to make a difference and not try to change the world. One theme of, of what we're talking about, and it comes directly from Marshall Gans as well, is your voice uh, in making a difference in people or in the systems or community. And I want to ask each of you about finding your voice and how you've used your voice. Let's start with you, Daisy. Well, I, I guess the real answer is I'm still finding my voice, um, working on that every day, um, trying to use my voice and, and probably trying not to remember when I haven't used my voice um, when I should have there been plenty of those moments. But I did want to share with you one experience and some of you know this because I think it, it overlaps with the themes that we're here to talk about. And that is a moment uh, when I had a decision to make. Um, when I was associate dean at Texas Tech, we were in a dean search, I was on the dean search committee. It was told to me by somebody I considered very credible that the president of the university had expressed that he was not willing to hire a woman to be dean. And I had a dilemma about what to do with that information, as you can imagine. Um, I decided to share that information. Um, that, as you can imagine, had a series of repercussions, and there was a moment when I was confronted with a choice. And the choice was to say, I don't really believe that's happened and that's a concern. The choice was to say, I'm not persuaded that this issue's been put to bed. I think we need to do more. Um, and I did find my voice to say, I'm sorry, I'm not persuaded. Um, I don't think I can share something that I don't believe is the truth. Um, and that led over the course of the next several years, ultimately to litigation, um, I ended up filing a lawsuit against the university while I was employed there for discrimination. The real underlying facts of that lawsuit had more to do with retaliation, but there were some other discrimination claims that were within that because it was a very ugly period as that process played out and the politics played out around it. Um, but the reason that I share that is because I would like to think I would have made that same choice regardless of what I'd been doing professionally and personally up until then, but I, it's very clear for me in the moment that I made that choice of this work that I had been doing with our students and with lawyers around authenticity really was informing my choice. 
Um, part of it was I could I could kind of picture my students, you know, I'd be standing in front of them, working with them one on one, and saying, you have courage, you've got to have integrity, you got to speak up. Um, so what was I going to do when it came to me? I had those students in in my head, and they were a motivator. Um, for about the first year of that um, situation, it was private. There were only a few people who really knew about it. But it did, as these things will do, became public, and the students got drawn into it. Um, and the other reason that I wanted to share it is that students found their voices around that issue. And what happened was very powerful as they began to claim their voices, um, including a student protest, um, which resulted in the six o'clock news that evening reporting that the president was leaving to go somewhere else. Um, I think there were multiple forces at play, but certainly that was empowering for the students and very empowering for me. So, um, I, you know, I, I, I tell you that story because I think it fits with the theme of today. I will tell you I don't regret that choice, but I will also tell you that that choice led to a lot of pain for a lot of people on all sides of that issue. And I do regret that. Um, but the students um, were really incredible there. And that experience has helped me in this work, continuing work. Thanks. Um, yeah, and when Daisy was speaking about law school, I was, um, you know, I, was uh, I didn't have to be a trailblazer um, in terms of a female in law school. Uh, um, thankful to folks like Daisy who were. But certainly in law school, um, my first year was spent just crying the whole semester and calling my mother saying, I don't belong here. Uh, there's no one that, there's very few people that sort of um, have my identity. There's also very few people who want to do public interest work. You know, and I, and I think that many of us were in that boat, and I think many of our students are in that boat um, in most, in many schools in the country. Um, so, you know, I, um, it took me probably a year and a half until I then became incredibly active at the age in law school and, and figured out, that, reminded myself that I, that I had a purpose there and it was bigger than, than all the competition and fodder and sort of noise around me. Um, so now, you know, when students come into my, my office, um, uh, it's very cluttered um, because there are no shortage of um, uh, quotes and images and sort of letting people know, I think, that I am grounded, right, and I want them to kind of feel grounded um, and in social justice when they come in. Um, and there's also pictures of my, my children because I think it's actually really important that I sort of share that I'm also a working parent with small children. I think that's a real challenge that many um, students of, of all genders and certain females face. Um, so, you know, I, um, uh, and I do believe that every student, regardless of where they work, can have a social justice um, ethos, which I kind of the title of one of the panels. And so I, 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 put, I definitely engage students on a regular basis who are not going to be radical social justice players, like I identify, right? Um, but I still want them to know who they're talking to. I actually think that that's important. I'm not trying to pretend I'm someone I'm not, right? Um, but you know, when I think about, I've always been very, very vocal about social justice work. I think I've um, sort of been vocal about who I am with students. But where I have struggled, which I'm sure the space where I think the space where other folks have struggled is a little bit in these faculty meetings, these dynamics. Um, and when I first joined the law school, you know, we'd go to our meetings and literally no, I'm a long-term contract faculty member. And literally no long-term faculty members spoke. Um, they just didn't speak meetings at all. And I'm not in a school with just 10 people. I mean, there's a 70 person faculty and um, we would just, none of them, whether it was like legal writing, um, our clinical folks, in house clinical folks, our tenured, um, uh, they just didn't talk, and I sort of, you know, you go with the flow, right? So I sort of didn't say anything either, um, even when the issues I think were really relevant to what I cared about or, or what I did. Um, and then I started thinking, my whole philosophy of warring is like to build the power of the marginalized, right? Like that is like who I am, and that's how I how I engage my pro bono work and blah blah blah. And like I'm literally not doing that, and I'm not servicing my peers in that way either, right? So I kind of decided to be like, I don't really care, and I'm just going to sort of speak up. This wasn't necessarily when I was a director or anything else, um, but I was like, I'm not, I'm not being who I am if I don't speak, right? Um, so I started to, and it wasn't necessarily even on controversial issues, right? It was just, just talking in general, sort of making my presence known. Um, and then as I transitioned into the director role three years ago, I realized how much that mattered even more because now I'm setting precedent for other folks, right? Um, and um, I think the faculty need to know what we do. Um, we also know our students probably best than anyone in the building, you know? Um, uh, and we know um, we know real practice, right? And I think it's our duty to inform our colleagues of what that stuff is. And, and I'm sure there are some people who are like, oh, here we go again, you know, here she's talking. Um, and <laughs> I mean, I don't take up more space than needed, to be clear, right? Um, but um, I, I think, I, you know, we lost, in the last few years, there were like three people who retired, right? So there's even fewer of us long-term faculty people in the room. Um, so I, I sort of felt like, 
I had to find my voice in that space. Uh, I feel very comfortable with students, um, and I had to find my voice in, in rooms with people like you, though you all I think are kindred spirits, but with other folks. And um, I think it has been really empowering, and I think it has also been, I think it's actually garnered me more respect and gotten me, um, uh, I've been invited to spaces that I don't think I would invite to if I were just sitting there, uh, because I think they know that I have something to say, and maybe they invite me politically at first, excuse me, but they also know I'm not a wallflower, and I think that's really, really important for people in our world. Voice. Voice. Uh, well, that's a oh gosh. So I, when I thought about this question, I guess for me it's sort of a, a couple different areas. I'm a three bucket person. You know, I'm always a three bucket person. So one was just my voice as a lawyer, and I, and I don't know. If, uh, and I'm, I consider myself a trial lawyer. I mean, that's uh, I, don't, I don't know how many of that way, but there's a point we all I think hopefully you find. Uh, I remember it was in my fourth jury trial, the really long, week long trial, that uh, the jury, uh, the judge, Judge Daniels, I don't know anybody knows here, but he put all the handbooks in Georgia on criminal law. He died a few years ago. He's the guy. And I used to love trying cases in front of the guy was the law and former defense lawyer, which is even more amazing for Georgia. <laughs> uh, and I remember that he had to you know, leave early and the jury went out. It was a very difficult case. And we had a, you know, a team of people there that went out. And I remember the court was empty. And this is in the old Fulton County Courthouse. Uh, not into a slick sort of rooms like this. And, and I remember just sitting there and it was a powerful moment. And actually, I remember thinking that I, I had this image of my father and all of the seats of the jury. And he sort of came with like an admiration, like came with a sense of which I was trying to case to my father. I was, uh, my father was the jury. And, and I remember just feeling, I've always liked this kind of work, but you have to feel confident. When a trial work is top, you know, there's always moving parts and there's evidence and witnesses and the judges and the, I mean, it's tough and it doesn't you don't get it all these books that people write about them they were immediately a trial so the hell no you know it takes a one house just the moving parts just to figure that out but i remember sitting in that courtroom and, and just, just just something just came over me it was really powerful but, but part of it was connected to my past and so i think there's another part of my voice i think that has come about for our voice as an organization by through our policy work uh, and that was a huge step for us and that was a real step with volunteers. Uh, Alex just mentioned Lane Denner, one of our uh, volunteers with a former Kansas Spalding lawyer who's helped start a lot of veterans programs in the state. And um, you know, the idea of showing up in the legislature to really impact really millions of people, the first main law we got changed, which is the rewrite of the expungement statute in Georgia, the night it went to effect was July 1st, 2013, 1.8 million Georgians had something fall off the record. I mean, and we brought our clients, we, we just had our big Justice Day at the Capitol a few weeks ago, so about 600 people were there. I mean, that, that, those are powerful times when you're lifting up an issue and bringing the voices of others and, and even our voice. So that's one way I think about this. But I, at the end of the day, I think, I think what Tim is intimating about this is a sense of identity and sense of self. And I've had this conversation with Dory, I've had it with other people, Marjorie and, and uh, uh, Daisy and Sue. But I think about Marjorie and her work with, with writing this book that I was fortunate enough to write a, a chapter in. Because I don't usually talk about my story. And not that I'm ashamed of it or I hide it, uh, but I don't usually think of that. And I have this whole theory that when you're in the South, that uh, if you're in the South with fewer resources and more problems, that your story means a lot less, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're in places with more resources uh, and less problems, you know, who you are becomes more important. That's my theory. You can talk about it. So I, I was, I've been doing this work for almost 30 years, and I can tell you on one or maybe two hands now how many times somebody has asked me why I do this work. It's just not important. I mean, that comes from my clients, it comes from funders, it comes from academics. Nobody really is, tell, tell me about why you're here. Now, I'm cool with that. Let me tell you, I have a theory, as I, as I said, that the reason is there's so many problems in the Deep South. It's about criminal justice and race and poverty. We got it all, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're willing to show up and be humble like my, our founders sort of said, if you're willing to show up and work for very little money, if you're willing to show up and get rid of all sort of aspirations of success and and stability in your economic and family life. You know, people are just like, bring it, come. As long as you're doing good work. So, so I often don't connect my sense of who I am and, and my sense of growing up impoverished with a single parent, with addiction, a sense of uh, growing up with my dad who uh, was a World War II veteran who went to law school for a second, but the bit, basically so he raised my brother and sister and I, sort of, uh, and just a sense of which, you know, moving, I mean, moving around a lot and, so uh, he was always a frustrated lawyer, so that's why I've been seen in the jury room. So all, all I'm saying is I don't, I don't have the sense that my story, oh, I see how it connects, don't get me wrong. I mean, 
I've spent a lot of time in counseling and 12 step meetings, don't get me wrong. But I don't see it showing up a lot in, in the work. Not, not in, you know, one last story. I'll tell you a story. I'm a lawyer, so we've got to tell stories. Uh, one time, the client, the murder case I've done, in one of the cases, actually, the fastest jury verdict I've ever had, about 20 minutes. Uh, and, uh, and this guy, he was a young guy, and, uh, uh, but he was connected to a church that I went to, an Episcopal church. And one day, uh, I saw him years later, and we're at church together. And, uh, and my wife is with me. And I was telling her, my wife is Kate Verdian, a woman of color, and African-American, and uh, multi Native American, very multi-ethnic person. And he looks at me, and he pulls me, and says, look, look, look at me, look at me. He said, why didn't you tell me you were married to a sister? <laughs> and I'm like, I look at him, and it was great. And I said, I've got to talk to you very recently. I said, would it matter? <laughs> I mean, I, I, the, my only point is, is that I, I'm not devaluing the role it has in my life, but I do think it's it's particular. I mean, I think in, in the space I'm in, and geographically, I think it's it's that's part of why it come, becomes less of a public discipline. Um, we've been talking, our panelists have been talking about the story of self, obviously, and Doug reluctantly, but there's a lot of good stuff about his self. We could hear more. But we want to move this to the story of us, and us including many communities, but especially the community represented in this room, the community of law school externships. So, so let me ask each of you, um, just generally your experience with your view of externships. We have people from three different perspectives. Doug as a supervisor of law students in the field. Uh, Lexi as a director of an externship program. And Daisy as somebody with a law school administrative experience and some teaching. So, so let's go in that order. Doug, just tell us a little bit about how law students and their work in your office is gone about. Well, uh, Daisy and I, so we're, uh, I'm going to tell a little bit about, uh, we, we have yeah, students who come. Oh, well, okay. okay. So one of the best stories, and I wasn't thinking because she happens to be a Mercer student, uh, but I mean, one of the best stories. We both wanted to claim her. I know. We're giving it to Doug. I know, no, 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 she's amazing. <laughs> so this woman named Ashley, who's, uh, who's a lawyer now in Macon, um, just working backwards. She, we had our, our first time we ever had another office, although Alex and I tried to start something up here about 15 years ago, probably at this Justice Project. So some, we had an office in Macon, and our office in Macon, Georgia, was Ashley. And Ashley got a, a we applied together and got an equal justice work for her to start doing criminal records work in middle Georgia. But the real story is that two years prior to that, I mean, I don't know what she was in class, because she was doing cases like crazy. She was doing externships without getting credit. She got credit. Uh, she was, I mean, she, I, you're right. I mean, uh, she, was, she was just, I mean, this woman, she was on fire to help me. And I was, she's a South Church, she's Cornell. I mean, she has the best accent. Now, you know, I come, well, I come loaded. She always carries her gun. I mean, I really, I go down with my grandma. So, you know, I'm like, she's like, she is the authentic South Georgia person who cares deeply about folks that graduate from all justice system. And I was like, this woman was amazing, and really, thanks. I, I, there's so many stories I can tell about Ashley. Not that just she worked with us full time for two and a half years until we tried kept raising money to keep that uh, office open in, in Macon. Uh, that didn't work. But Ashley is still a resource. We talked to her last week about some legislative stuff. Um, so yeah, she I first came to you as, as an expert. Yeah. She came. That's right. I'm sorry. That's <laughs> cool. <laughs> <laughs> I was leaving at the Daisy to pick up. She's, she, no, no, no. That, that, I just, I have so many. Ashley's just an amazing person that we would have never had the kind of engagement we had with her, with anybody, after the externship, externship program. We had her come on staff and the Equal Justice Works and Justice Committee. And she still is a great part of our sort of more wider circle team, although she's not on staff. So I'm very thankful, of course, to Mercer, but really to externship opportunities that allowed her to come up to our office and often do the work we were doing in you know, 70 miles away, supervised by our staff and by the, the faculty. Uh, and I gotta tell you, let me just say, I just gonna put this plug in, that you know, I'm an Atlanta person now, I've been there for 30 years, and I, I forget that somebody who's in that community who can talk with the same accent, and didn't I see you at Sunday school last week? I mean, she got more <laughs> results. I mean, results we would never even try to get, she was able to get. And so, I mean, her being locally based and supported by the law school in that community, even while she was a student, honestly, and much less later, it was amazing. So I have a huge, huge thanks uh, for externship opportunity. Well, great, yeah. Um, I'm happy to talk about externships. I guess from the administrative perspective, of course, they're wonderful because what are we about? We're about helping our students learn who they are, to be self-aware about who they're becoming, to meet the world's needs, to join their profession, and in my opinion, there's no better way to do that than through experiential education. That's a really important piece of that. And 
What we've seen in our externship program is it has allowed us to put students in a variety of settings through which, of course, they can observe lawyers in action. They can sometimes represent clients um, under supervision. Um, but they also have that opportunity for some distance from uh, the supervisor under the guidance of a faculty member to reflect on that experience and to learn from that experience. And because I care about this issue of authenticity and professional identity, I think there's no better place than an experiential education to really bring all of those threads together for our students. Um, and there are two reasons uh, for that. I think one is that you've got this classroom component where you don't have the coverage issue that you have if you're teaching evidence or criminal law or doctrinal course. Uh, where you can really say to students, this is about you, and we're going to work on you, and this is an opportunity for you to practice some things, to reflect on things, to get better in this supportive environment, so that you are prepared when you get out there, maybe not fully prepared, but you are more prepared than you would have been when you get out there and you begin to encounter these issues um, in practice. And so I think externships are just so well suited for that particular space, and, and we use that. So uh, in, in the way that ours have unfolded at Mercer. And then uh, I've had an opportunity probably six or seven times to teach on our externship course. Um, and those have been some of my favorite moments of teaching. Uh, and the reason for that is the amazing development students have in the course of that one semester. I just Every time I'm amazed at how much growth there is. I am amazed at the way they share themselves with their journaling. My favorite thing to do is to read those journals um, and not only to see what they're sharing about their growth, but to also see how well they write when they're talking about that compared to how they write sometimes when they're talking about other things. So, you know, I mean, we, I had one student, and I, I, I told her, I said, you've got to keep writing. I mean, you've got to write memoirs. You've got to, you've got to do something. She was just poetic in the way she was describing her experience. And let's face it, that's what we're all trying to do in legal education is prepare those students. So, of course, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of externship. I do want to put a point in on supervisors and the effect that we have on supervisors. Tim and I recently um, met somebody who has supervised our students for years as a public defender, and she told us, she said, I would not still be doing this work if it were not for the fact that I got to work with those students because they're what keep me excited and engaged. And she said, there's so much hard about what I do. If it weren't for those students, I don't think I would still be doing it. So don't forget about that. So I, I think I'm what stands between um, the panel talking at and you all talking among. So I'm going to be quite brief um, in this, but because I think we know, right? We all know the value of externships. We all know they're where the head, hearts, and hand be. And I've not coined that term. That's something many book, right? That's for someone who phrase that actually. Um, so you know they're critical, right? To understand who you are, where you come from, you know, and, and where you're going, right? And I think they're confidence builders. I think they're skill builders. Um, I think they're where light bulbs and ideas generate, right? Um, so if it's okay, I think I'm going to leave it at that because I think it would be better um, to have folks. Um, one of the things um, that we wanted to do in the story of us is actually have us engage, right? Um, so um, I, I think it's really important, um, though, um, I, mean, I don't think it's a contradiction to what you're saying, that would never contradict you, but I, I do think it's important <laughs> to know yourself, right? Especially if you're going to try to talk to students about knowing themselves, right? Having those things guide you. I think it's actually important to know yourself. And I think, I think it's great, even if you're not professing it anymore, right? Um, so, um, so what we want to do, um, and I don't know if it's a 10, 12 minute, whatever, when we see where we're at, um, have kind of talk to a partner um, and kind of do a little bit maybe of two things, a little bit of um, your abbreviated story of self and, and how you've come to kind of be in this space, um, and then a little bit of how you think um, your role um, in externships and externships generally kind of fit into this, this broader scheme of legal education.
looking at the clock and checking the airline schedule. We promised to have you out of here no later than 11.30 with all the wrap up and everything so you can make it to where you need to go. But, but if you could stick with us through the end here, because we are turning to the third story, um, and that is the story of now. Um, and what, what I want to ask our panelists is just each of them um, tell us about a significant experience, either with a student or with a client, or anything about your work as we go forward in our work. So in any words, you want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll go broad. I think you may tell a specific story um, in the I don't know. Um, but um, rather than maybe giving an example of a student or two, because I know and you all have those students who stick with us, right? Mm -hmm. Who's um, will stay with us for a long time. I mean, I guess I'll give an example of how I think that can come out. Um, maybe that's useful. Um, so one of the things, and I know Susan knows that I've done this, um, but one of the things that I do is I have students in one of my um, sort of first day of classes, I have them draw. Um, I give them paper, I give them crayons, and I basically tell them to draw their story, um, who they are and what's got them to go to this placement, right, wherever it may be. Um, and it's almost like a timeline of sorts a little bit, because I say try not to focus on like one picture, you know, like a, one building or one person, but try to think about like how you've gotten here. Um, and at first they're sort of like, why am I, you know, why am I doing this? Um, and, um, and I do it for a couple of reasons. One, I think that, um, they often realize they do have a story, right? Um, because they think, oh, well, I chose this placement because of X, Y, Z. No, there's probably something deeper there, right, um, that led you to this space and led you to that placement. Um, and they, I think when you're drawing, it's a little less vulnerable, right? You're not speaking, giving a sort of um, speech in front of people that you sort of don't necessarily know that much. Um, I also tell it because I think when you do anything in the social justice field, whether you're doing it in a private firm, you're doing it in an organization like Doug's, like, you need to be creative, right? Um, you need to think outside the box because um, the same strategies just simply do not work, right, um, all the time. Um, so um, I think that it forces them to think a little bit about um, the, the toolbox, right, that they have um, and using the different part of the brain. Um, and it just, I think it just remembers them, like it helps them remind themselves of their true motivation. Um, and then I have a select number of students share their stories. They don't require, or share their pictures, right? I don't ask everyone to do it because I think some people are not comfortable. Um, but I collect them, right? And then I, and then we have a sort of one-on-one -on -one engagement um, regardless with everyone, even if they haven't shared. And it's pretty amazing where they say things like, you know, I didn't think about it, but then I thought about this and this happened, right? And it could be something that happened 10 years ago or it could be something that happened 10 days ago. Um, so I found it to be a really great exercise of getting them into the idea of also reflection, um, but doing it in a different way, right? And doing it in a way that I think is very grounded in, in sort of social justice, right? Because social justice it really celebrates different disciplines, right? It celebrates um, uh, creativity. Um, so, and I think our students get into such a big role sometimes of law school and, and, and process that they forget, like, to just sort of think a little differently. So that's, maybe I'll just use that as a way that I think people can help people find, find their voice. <coughs> It was the day after July 4th, a few years ago, and I was actually surprised that the Supreme Court of Georgia actually had hearings that day. I was, I was sure it was some kind of fluke. The 5th of July had an argument on a very tough murder case that Tim was familiar with. And we went to court, and uh, we prepared as best we could, uh, and standing in the courtroom afterwards, uh, we had the family, about 30 to 40 people at the Supreme Court hearing. And this is a murder case that we had taken on from the moment of arrest the out of the Georgia Supreme Court. We ended up taking a trend of the U.S. Supreme Court. We wrote all from that, I hope you know, uh, did the appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court to tell them as well, ever since. So. But they didn't take it. And obviously we lost the case at every level. A young man uh, who did not shoot anybody, but he was with some people that did. And um, it's a long story. And we're standing outside of the courtroom the court the, uh, with the family and a couple of our clients' uncles decided to hold the court. And, uh, and we had a bunch of law students, and we had family and staff, and people, volunteers who worked on the case, folks from big firms. Uh, and two of the uncles, who I knew, uh, but they said, they sort of said, look, they said, today, they said, we don't know what's going to happen. They said, but, um, but we know that we have fought, you know, whatever happens, that we know you all have done everything you could, and that we fought for justice. And these are blue collar guys, who were standing in court hoping that their nephew would not serve the rest of his life in prison, uh, who had a life sentence. And it was almost like a prayer vigil, honestly. And we stood there, and, and um, 
And that later that day, of course, from the week leading up, I had been just slammed with this, obviously doing nothing else but getting ready. And so I decided to take my younger son, who was pretty young at the time, to go. He loved the quick trip milkshakes. If you ever haven't had a quick trip milkshake, you should. <laughs> and so I decided to take him to get a milkshake. And, and we would go to the milkshake, play, you know, the quick trip. And it's a busy day on July 5th, of all things. And as I'm going into the store, this, uh, uh, I remember noticing this. this uh, Hispanic woman is opening the door, and there's an uh, older African American woman, kind of kind of chasing about a three-year-old out into the parking lot. Now, quick trips. This is a busy. They're always busy, but this was a really busy day. And the Hispanic woman and I are looking at each other. And we look at the kid. We look at the grandma. And sort of hobbling, and then we 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 offer to sort of. And then the grandma basically falls down while she's chasing the daughter, the granddaughter, and we sort of the the, the other woman and I sort of kind of grab the kid so she doesn't run. And you know, we sort of pull her back in and hand her off to the grandmother. And we no not a word was exchanged among all of us, you know, and then we just sort of looked at each other and went on, got the milkshake and left. And and I was pulling out of that parking lot and I swear I, I just got to tears. I mean it's been a hard week and, and I thought to myself, and I've asked myself often, why do I do this work? I ask myself for that all the time. <laughs> I write about it, I struggle with it, I think about it. And I just thought about this, this notion I just hit me that, that what, what, at the end of the day, what we're doing for this guy who actually is in prison, we just saw him and we just want to see him in prison, we're still visiting him in prison. Uh, and his family, we're still working with his family. But I thought, at the end of the day, it's about love. And I said, it, you know, it's about acceptance and it's about this embrace. I mean, that's what we're standing up for. That's what those uncles were trying to tell us in that, in that hallway and it's outside of the Georgia Supreme Court. But all these great people who helped on this case from the moment this kid got arrested and 10 members because he worked on the team. And all the amazing people, students, lawyers, law professors, I've had so much help on this case, and still this kid's in jail. So at the end of the day, we what this sort of reminds me, yes, we should love each other, and that's, at the end of the day, what it's all about. I mean, I hate to be that, you know, that, <laughs> you know, whatever, probably anybody. But at the end of the day, too, what I realized is that as hard as I work, I mean, at the end of the day, I think what I am trying to do in my life, I often say, is to prove God's not a liar is to prove that people who are not ignored and not accepted and are not embraced are embraced and accepted and supported. At the end of the day, I think a lot of us are trying to prove that God is not a liar, that there is acceptance, that there is love in the world, and we are the manifestations of that. But what happens when it doesn't show up? What happens when we fail? That's what that case for those 10 years we worked in this case I mean, has, has really, I've struggled to come to terms with. Uh, is it, are we, you know, is God a liar? If, if, can justice still go down wrongly when, I mean, badly and injustice happen when you pull out every stop for people who you think is innocent, who you believe are innocent? So I think about that case a lot. I've not written a whole lot. I've not shit markers like, Tom, you shouldn't put that in the chat. <laughs> I, I do think about, I think, at the end of the day, that that's, that's the struggle that I, I think about a lot. Is that we're there to represent, to love folks, to represent a reality to people. And sometimes that reality does not come true. And that, that with and the incredible support of so many people, it still doesn't come true. But still, we persist. Follow that. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm going to be a strategic stage here. <laughs> Asking Doug to go before me. Um, and so, uh, I'm going to answer your question, Doug. And it's one that our students are facing all the time. And that we as teachers have to face with them. And so maybe, hard to follow you, but maybe I can bring it a little bit back to, to legal education and our role. I think the paradox of what we try to do as educators is that we seek to transform our students, but we seek for them to hold on to who they are and to the purpose that brought them to law school while they're being transformed. And that's a difficult balance to achieve. So, one of the things I like to do with my students is remind them of the purpose, get them to reflect why they came to law school. They often have a hard time articulating that specifically, but there's a common thread through all the students I've asked to do this through the many, many years, and that is they want their lives to have meaning. They want the professional work they do to matter. And they have a sense that by using the powers of lawyers, using what they're going to acquire in law school, they can make a difference in people's lives. And I think then make a difference more broadly with these systems that we're talking about. And so 
we have to tap into that with our students. I do think that our stories matter and that we need to know those stories. We need to be self-aware. Let me recommend a book to you if you're not familiar with it, Parker Palmer, The Courage to Teach. And he says the best teaching is that, I mean, if you want to be a good teacher, you've got to bring who you are into the classroom. You expect your students to bring who they are, you've got to bring who you are, and that is hard, hard work. Um, when I first discovered that book, I made a pledge of going to reread it every year at the start of the fall semester. Of course, I've let that go, but um, I'm now I'm vowing to reread it as a result of this. So one quick story, a student, um, because I think about this student a lot. He came into externship. Uh, he was from a small town in Georgia, um, not somebody who would describe himself as coming to law school to be a social justice advocate, wanted to go into a small practice, kind of a general practice after law school, but he chose to serve his externship with the uh, local office of Georgia Legal Services. And he said at the time, I kind of need to get out of my comfort zone and I want to stretch myself and I'm going to use the externship for this purpose. And in a debriefing at the end of the semester, he shared with the class, he said, you know, it hasn't changed what I want to do for my paid work, but he said it's changed my view of so many things and I'm now going to be an advocate, I'm going to be involved, I have a new appreciation for the hard work that goes on in that office and I will always now work to change that even though I haven't decided that's what I want to do with my own work and I think that's one small story of somebody who was transformed holding on maybe to many things that were important to him and what his goals were, and that's the hard work that we do every day. And I applaud you all for doing it. It does get discouraging at times, and I think we're in a time, when we talk about the story of now, of course we all know it's a time when it can be discouraging. The flip side of that is a time when I think lawyers have never mattered more. So helping our students to see that is really So I think maybe our, the last thing we're going to do before Sue um, closes us out as sort of energetically and passionately as she always does, um, uh, we want to show a short, this is like a three, four minute video, um, uh, you know, to Daisy's point, I think, um, you know, where we are now, right, both in the education as we have these really like, really intimidating but also maybe helpful standards and also this world where um, the world is like really kind of scary on some fundamental levels. Um, I think we have sort of no choice um, but to, um, whether we are driven to fight sort of fiercely or love compassionately, we have to do something, right? We have to speak, um, and I think we have to empower our students to speak. So I have used um, this video at times to sort of encourage that. Um, and I also think it's really important, just before I play the video, is um, to bring in non-lawyer voices. While I fully agree um, that lawyers are legitimately needed um, for traditional legal battles and non-traditional legal battles now maybe more than ever. I also think, you know, people like Marshall Gantz, right? Um, people like Clint Smith, um, they have been in the trenches of social justice, um, um, people like that, et cetera, for so long. Um, but I, and I think it's really important to, to look for non-lawyer inspiration um, as well. Because I think our students can get, in our law school, we get in our bubbles and so do our students, right? Even if they do an externship for a moment. So I think finding ways to bring in different voices in the classroom is really important. Mm -hmm. So I think with that, I'll be quiet and we'll hopefully this will focus. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., in a 1968 speech where he reflected upon the civil rights movement, stated, In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. As a teacher, I've internalized this message. Every day all around us, we see the consequences of silence manifest themselves in the form of discrimination, violence, genocide, and war. In the classroom, I challenge my students to explore the silences in their own lives and hope. We work together to fill those spaces, to recognize them, to name them, to understand that they don't have to be sources of shame. In an effort to create a culture within my classroom where students feel safe sharing the intimacies of their own silences, I have four core principles posted on a board that sits in the front of my class, which every student signs at the beginning of the year. Read critically, write consciously, Speak clearly. Tell your truth. I find myself thinking a lot about that last one. Tell your truth. And I realized that if I was going to ask my students to speak up, I was going to have to tell my truth. 
and be honest with them about the times where I failed to do so. So I tell them that growing up as a kid in a Catholic family in New Orleans, during Lent, I was always taught that the most meaningful thing one could do was to give something up, sacrifice something you typically indulge in to prove to God you understand the sanctity. I picked up soda, McDonald's, French fries, French kisses, and everything in it. <laughs> but one year, I gave up speaking, thinking the most valuable thing I could sacrifice was my own voice, but it was like I hadn't realized that I had given that up a long time ago. I had spent so much of my life telling people the things they wanted to hear instead of the things they needed to. Told myself I wasn't meant to be in this conscience because I still had to figure out being my own, so sometimes I just wouldn't say anything. Appeasing ignorance with my silence, unaware that validation doesn't need words to endorse its existence. When Christian was beat up for being gay, I put my hands in my pocket and walked with my head down as if I didn't even notice. Couldn't use my locker for weeks because the bolt on the lock reminded me of the one I had put on my lips when the homeless man on the corner looked at me with eyes up, merely searching for an affirmation that he was worth seeing. I was more concerned with touching the screen of my apple after than actually feeding him one when the woman at the fundraising gallery said, I'm so proud of you. It must be so hard teaching those poor, unintelligent kids. I bit my lip because apparently we needed her money more than my students needed their dignity. We spend so much time listening to the things people are saying that we rarely pay attention to the things they don't. Silence is the residue of fear. It is spilling your flaws gut wrench guillotine your tongue. It is the air retreating from your chest because it doesn't feel safe in your lungs. Silence is Rwandan genocide. Silence is Katrina. It is what you hear when there aren't enough body bags left. It is the sound after the noose is already tied. It is charring. It is chains. It is privilege. It is pain. There is no time to pick your battles when your battles have already picked you. I will not let silence wrap itself around my indecision. I will tell Christian that he is a lion, a sanctuary of bravery and brilliance. I will ask that homeless man what his name is and how his day was because sometimes all people want to be is human. I will tell that woman that my students can talk about transcendentalism like their last name was Thoreau. And just because you watched one episode of The Wire doesn't mean you know anything about my kids. So this year, instead of giving something up, I will live every day as if it were a microphone tucked under my tongue a stage on the underside of my individual. Because who has to have a sofa when all you ever need is your voice? Thank you.
Uh, if you remember in Plenary 1, which was just a little while ago, or a million light years ago, uh, that we asked you if you found this useful to track as your thoughts were changing and or evolving, but certainly what are you most committed to working on to improve or sustain externships as you sit here today? And the purpose for which we do that is evident right here. So I'm not going to collect them. We may ask on Lextern uh, to just say if anybody's got some thoughts, thoughts, we'd love for you to share them and we'll process them back and put them on the website. But if if you get a chance, please do so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. 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 Um, you learned, you found restaurants, right? <laughs> and last, but by no means least, we feel, we happy feel we got up in the early dark. Nice <laughs> 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 uh, job. Uh, often the focus of feedback for conferences like this is on the organizers, and it's true. The planning committee has worked extraordinarily hard. I want to be sure to thank our sponsors, Core Technologies, and Equipment, who very much helped put this conference together. Um, but what makes this conference rattle and hum is the hard work of each and every presenter. Taking care and thought to give us the benefit of their insight and their experience. So let's just give a round of applause to all of them. Few administrative points, very few. First, tomorrow, well today I'll be doing it again. I'll be sending out a link to the conference ass uh, assessment survey. Yes, another survey. Is it on Yelp? No. Please fill it out. The Exponentships Committee tend to be, uh, the planning committee for this conference tends to be persistent year to year and really uses and benefits. From the feedback, but please fill it out and give us your praise, but give us your criticism as well. Second, I will also send out a, a request to every presenter to send in your materials, PowerPoint, handouts, videos. All of the materials that we have received so far, we have linked on the conference website. They're there now, right? So if you too can be linked on the conference website, send it to me. I'll give you instructions to help you that. Third, we will be processing videos for each session within the next couple weeks. I'll put a notice out to the listeners. Sorry, I'm <laughs> We'll be processing the videos soon. I'll send out notices when we're ready. Every session but one has been video, and that was by request to the presenters. Finally, a reminder. Put your presentations in writing, all right? Early in the conference, Kate Cruz noticed how externship teaching is under theorized. You may remember that. But this conference shows otherwise. Right? There have been lots of theories about externship pedagogy. In the rooms, in the halls, on the streets, right? So please write out your thoughts and submit them the clinical law review. <laughs> yeah. The deadline for considering consideration for a possible symposium issue from this conference is June 1st. So please consider writing out your thoughts. All right, now I'm going to close. I promise to keep this short. Um, I want to close by doing what all good teachers should do, which is to steal from other teachers. <laughs> right? I mean, that's what we should be doing. In this case, I'm going to steal from a poet, Jane Miller, from her poem, which has a great title, May You Always Be the Darling of Fortune. Mm -hmm. So here's the excerpt, very short. March 10th, and the snow flees into rain. The imperceptible change begins out of an old rage and glistens with its new crate spring. May your desire always overcome your need. Your story that you have to tell, enchanting, beautiful, may it fill the world that you believe. 
travel safe. Keep doing your good work.